what about uh, the first line setting? Uh, what do you, uh, what's your uh, go-to regimen? And again, I, I realize that everybody individualizes based <laughs> on certain factors. But in general, what's your go-to regimen in the frontline treatment of ovarian cancer, ovarian slash fallopian tube slash peritoneal cancer, uh, where the patient for some reason cannot go on a clinical trial? Uh, who wants to start? I'll start. Okay. Optimal surgical side reduction and IP therapy. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, and we'll get back to IP therapy in just a moment, okay? Yeah. So, um, you know, up until recently it was uh, weekly Pacotaxel, but now we're, now we're switching over to IP. Okay, for, for the optimally reduced optimal. patients. Yeah. What about the suboptimally reduced patients? Give yeah, weekly. Well, what weekly new data carbon? caused you to go yeah, from right? weekly Pacotaxel to IP? Um, because it has to do with the, our algorithm for you know selecting patients. So our R0 rates have gone up tremendously now um, mm -hmm. because we select those patients out ahead right. of time. And so for the R0 patients, I still think that IP is something that we should think about. So R0, okay. IP no works better in R0 as opposed to zero to one centimeter? Wait, wait say it again. IP is a, works better in R0 rather than zero no, to no, one I'm centimeter No, no, I'm saying residual? that we have a higher proportion of R0 patients that are ending up for adjuvant therapy post-surgery. So we tend to, we're starting to use more IP now. Okay, so both of you are using IP therapy in your uh, optimally bulk reduced patients. Presumably anybody less than one centimeter or only R0? You know, I think you could take IP therapy all the way up to two centimeters. I agree. Um, you know, I, that's where the original data was done. And I think this R0.5, <laughs> one centimeter is, is kind of arbitrary. So I, I would hate to um, not offer a patient IP therapy based on those. Sometimes they can be very subjective numbers. It's not always objective. Mm -mm. Rob, it might be informative. Just, just if you would talk about the Anderson uh, algorithm. algorithm that yeah. you're using, because I think that so, that's really interesting. It yeah, takes the out, the subjectivity out of it a little bit because you have a second opinion. Yeah, you know, it's always been hard to um, come up with a good scoring system or an algorithm to pick who you should operate on. I think we've come to realize that no visible residual is probably the you know that's probably means a lot more than optimal in our traditional definitions, um, and and so we we were trying to come up with a better way to do that. We found that we couldn't use anything. Uh, imaging-wise alone or just clinical guess. And in our, frankly, in our practice, we were starting to use a lot of new adjuvant in patients that probably could have been operated on. So we adopted Anna Fagotti's um, um, <laughs> system, which was originally based on less than one centimeter um, residual. And, um, and that, what that is is this laparoscopic assessment of seven areas in the abdominal cavity for resectability, and you add up a score. And um, when it gets to a certain point, the, the probability of a complete res of a resection, optimal resection, goes to zero when you surpass a certain number. So, in the, and, and in her hands, it was eight, and ours is very similar. We applied that to the R0, and we're coming up with basically the same thing with a couple special caveats. And so with that triage mechanism, um, we still have about a 65, uh, 35, or 70, 30 um, primary debulking versus new adjuvant, but the R0 rates have gone over 80% in each setting. Impressive. Okay, uh, so both of you want IP therapy in the uh, optimally reduced, uh, bulk reduced patients, but in the suboptimally bulk reduced patients. I use weekly taxol carbo. I hate that I can't say individualization, but um, since you're not allowing me to go there, I would say Q3 week, Paclitaxel. Paclitaxel carboplatin? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh. It's discouraging, <laughs> right? It's, it's discouraging. So we had a little bit of agreement on resistant disease, mm -hmm. which is the worst scenario. We had, yes, yeah, sort of some agreement in sensitive. Now we can't agree at all on frontline. And, and I, I can't imagine being a patient. This is the most important decision. Mm -hmm. and, and, and none of us are going to agree. So, this is, so let, me, let, let me try to give you some very good rationale. I use weekly, dose dense weekly, no, no skipping. So paclitaxel at 80 all the way through, okay? Based on the Japanese data, which mm -hmm. has a survival advantage. Mm -hmm. With carboplatin, with carboplatin, carboplatin AUC is 6 on every three weeks. Every three so weeks. it's got a randomized trial that supports that. Yep. And the reason I don't use IP, because IP is weekly and dose dense, and that's why I do it, but I give it in the vein. And then in the large volume residual disease greater than a centimeter, according to the European Society of Medical Oncology guidelines, I know I'm American, <laughs> but, but, but there's a survival advantage, again, in the large volume residual stage four patients in ICON-4 and also in GOG-218, the frontline bevacizumab. So based on those three trials where there's a survival advantage, 
You can refute it. I give weekly dose dense in the small volume residual disease, less than a centimeter, and in the large volume residual disease, stage four, I add bevacizumab to Q3 week. I can tell you what I never do is do weekly and Bev together. So, so but you're in a state where you can give Bev front line. So I, I didn't caveat, I didn't put that caveat in, our, in, my, in my answer, but in our state, we can't give Bev frontline. Okay, and that's fair enough. And, and I will, I also caution people over interpreting the ICON-7 large volume no local residual because when we actually applied that to D218, we did not see a survival difference. We only saw it in the stage four patients. That's right. But okay, it was still, so, it was but eight again, months. it's hypothesis generated, it so I wouldn't months, say there was a uh, survival it was, It's advantage. a hypothesis generated, but it's very consistent results between the stage four and 218 and large varm residual and ICON-7. So the fact that they're, that they are congruent. But they're not, but it's not the same in 218, which is a better study I from understand. a placebo standpoint. As, as I said, I'm discouraged that we can't okay, agree. Okay, all right. But Dr. you would Her say it was an option. Dr. Herzog, small volume disease, I do intraperitoneal as long as the patient's a good candidate for it. Um, and for those that are not optimal, I still do um, carboplatinum, paclitaxel every three weeks. I do have a discussion about BEV. It's often not covered. You can get ours, it ours is Ours is more heterogeneous. So, some plans yes, some plans no. So it's been alluded to several times in the discussions, but nobody's really nailed down why. Uh, Brad, I think you made in particular a comment a while ago that you would not use weekly paclitaxel and BEV at the same time in the frontline setting. Tell us why. So there was a study called GOG-262 which tried to confirm or refute the weekly question, the one that was Japanese that I alluded to, which you're familiar with. The problem was that in that study, some patients got bevacizumab and some didn't. In fact, most of them got bevacizumab. So when bevacizumab is in the mix, weekly is not better in that study. I think it's fairly definitive. The hypothesis generating 112 patients that didn't get Bev weekly still mattered. So again, I, I, I'm just, I can't imagine being a listener here. So you got the four experts, at least you four, I'm just here. And, <laughs> That's and, true. And, 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 and not one of us agrees on how to treat newly diagnosed advanced ovarian cancer. Imagine what it's like to be well, a patient. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, well, we're I being, wouldn't say we're, that. These are, these are very subtle differences in terms of schedule. We're talking about the same drugs. We're talk, I mean, you make it sound like we're talking about treating them with uh, Fruit Loops versus, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Hey, Tate, you did you did Yeah, Tate, you're, you're the, you're, you're the, you're you're the, the professor. IP. Come on, okay. go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. This won't decide the argument amongst the panel, but uh, uh, in terms of what we actually do, uh, we use every three week taxol carboplatin bevacizumab outside of clinical trial unless there's a pressing reason sure. contra contrary right. to that. The reason we do that is because uh, the data from GOG 262 indicate that weekly taxol is not necessary when bevacizumab is included in the combination. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Um, we also have significant issues with the uh, interperitoneal data and we have one more trial hanging out there that uh, is going to be mature within the next six months uh, and that trial will settle that to, to some degree. The, the problem with the earlier, the last two earlier interperitoneal uh, studies is that the interperitoneal therapy was tremendously toxic, particularly in the last uh, one of those where the frequency of grade 3, 4 uh, toxicity with uh, interperitoneal therapy was substantially higher in almost every toxicity category. Uh, and in fact, the clinical alert in 2006 that recommended IP therapy said they couldn't recommend any of the tested regimens. Right. So the whole purpose <laughs> of the uh, fourth trial, GOG-252, uh, is to determine whether you can modify the regimens and make them more tolerable and still retain the alleged advantage in, in terms of progression-free and overall survival. And we'll know that answer fairly soon. But everyone uh, gets BEV in that trial. So right, you've already no, alluded to the dilution group. of the effect. That's, That's right. true. And if everybody gets BEV and BEV eliminates the advantage for interperitoneal therapy, I would think, and I, I, I can't speak for everybody, but I think that the majority of people are going to opt to give a taxol carboplatin bevacizumab combination rather then go through all of the logistical problems and potential toxicity yeah, associated fair. with that okay. peritoneal therapy. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that, uh, that what the panel has given you for frontline therapy is that taxol and carboplatin uh, represent the two most important chemotherapeutic agents in this category. There was uniform agreement mm -hmm. uh, for those two. Uh, and that the addition of bevacizumab uh, remains at the present time somewhat of an open question. Uh, with some, like myself, seeing the data that bevacizumab ought to be included, others seeing uh, the data that uh, weekly taxol plus carboplatin might suffice or an interperitoneal approach might suffice depending on the volume of disease left. Uh, so with the understanding that there are still some unsettled questions, 
I think that uh, uh, if you had to list the three most important drugs here, they're taxol carboplatin and then bevacizumab with the caveats that, uh, that we've given. Is that a fair statement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, and the interperineal therapy question, hopefully we'll have the answer to that uh, sometime within the next six to 12 months so we can argue more. <laughs> <laughs> now. Uh,